Hello everyone, happy Sunday. We're back online and we're glad you're joining us for today's service. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, whether you're from Orangeville, Shelburne, Grand Valley, or somewhere else in the world, welcome to Compass. My name is Jen and I'm part of the staff team and this is my daughter, Hannah. Well, we've had a lot of fun being on location to host our services. It's sort of like taking Compass on the road, or well, in today's case, on the tracks. And you know, there are some really neat places to visit, and we hope that you've been able to get out and enjoy a change of scenery this summer on your very own road trips. Well, for our family, we just came back from our own road trip, and every year we remind ourselves and the kids that we are creating memories, regardless of the ups and downs we've had along the way, including things like losing your shoe on the highway, taking a hike in the rain, and having some unwanted extra friendly chipmunks, right, Hannah? Oh yeah, good memories, Mom. What a great trip. I'm sure this won't be our last and that there'll be many more ahead of us, but not like the characters in today's message. We're going to look at the prophets Elijah and Elisha as they take their last road trip together. Bill Baruch will unpack the story as we continue in our summer road trip series. And we've got Joe Kennedy ready to lead us in some songs of worship. It's going to be an awesome service. Well, before we start, let's quiet our hearts and minds as we participate together in this call to worship. You know, whatever your week has been like, we invite you to take this time to reflect and pause before our wonderful creator, savior, and friend. We pray that you will be open to hear his gentle whisper and that you will graciously receive all he has in store for you today. We'll see you at the end of the service. We'll see you then. Worthy is 
what it means to do what is good by seeking righteousness and justice. Rescue the oppressed, uphold the rights of the fatherless and defend the widow's cause. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Do you remember that family road trip? The one you couldn't wait for? It was an adventure in search of memories. A quest for fun. Car rides full of spontaneous karaoke, road games, quality family time, and the occasional bump in the road. The destinations were grand, but what sticks with us most is what happened along the way. Because the experiences that add the most value to our lives have never been about destinations, but shared along the journey of getting there. Join us for a summer road trip as we explore how to make this summer into one of purpose that will propel us forward in this journey of life. Good morning. Today we're going to continue our summer road trip series. And today we're going to talk about the last road trip for Elijah and Elisha. Last week we were introduced to Elijah. And in that introduction, we learned how he had defeated the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And as he did that, it disturbed and upset Jezebel, who then threatened his life. And Elijah ran in fear until the Lord came and in his grace and his love ministered him back to health. Well, today we're going to see the prophet Elijah again, this time on a road trip, and on a road trip with a man who would succeed him, Elisha. This will be Elijah's final road trip, ending with this incredible, powerful scene where the Lord takes him up to heaven in a whirlwind with chariots of fire. This will also, though, be a significant road trip for Elisha. For it leads him to a place where the torches pass to him from Elijah, and Elijah takes on the role of being the prophet for Israel. We will see Elisha being called, we will see him empowered, and then he was obedient to do the work of the Lord as God's prophet. So too, when we think about it, are we called by Jesus? and empowered by Him and His Spirit, that we might do what He's asked us to do. And so I want to encourage you to join in today. And as we hear the details and the message of this road trip, I'm hoping that you will be part of it, and you will experience exactly what Elijah and Elisha experienced during their road trip. I'm going to invite you now to open up your Bibles and turn to 2 Kings chapter 2, Old Testament 2 Kings chapter 2, and this is where we will read about this road trip that Elijah 
and Elijah took. And as we do that, and you turn to 2 Kings 2, uh, just to let you know that during this pat message, you may hear me get the two of them mixed up a little bit just because the names are so close, Elijah and Elisha. Well, you'll understand, I'm sure, if I uh, kind of get them mixed up at times, and that'll be all right. Well, let's bow in prayer. Let's invite the Lord now to speak to us as we walk through their journey together, their road trip together, their final one. And so let's invite the Lord to talk to us and speak to us today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that today we can walk through this road trip with Elijah and Elisha. And I pray as we hear not only of the details of what happens and the words that will be spoken, that you will speak to our hearts, that you will have freedom to minister to us as we see your word. And so we invite you to do that right now in each home and for each person. And I ask this in Christ's name, amen. Well, it is in 2 Kings chapter 2, I hope you found it, that we read these words. Verse 1, right away, begins to introduce and gives us a couple of foundational facts about this remarkable journey the two are about to take. Verse 1 tells us that when the Lord was about to take Elijah to heaven, in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Well, the first thing we see here, two foundational facts. The first one is this, that Elijah, Elijah was about to go to heaven in a whirlwind. Now, prior to this, Elijah had been busy doing the work of the Lord as God's prophet. And he played a beautiful role of being obedient to God and doing what he had asked him to do. And now this prophet, we are told, is about to be taken up. It's funny to me that, that right away in this, this chapter, it goes right there. He's about to be taken up in a whirlwind, as if it's common fact. So here it is. He's about to go. And you may ask the question, well, prophet, what actually is the prophet of God in the Old Testament? Well, it's simply, and this isn't going to be in, in great detail, but simply the role of the prophet, his job was to hold God's people accountable to the Lord and to the nation of Israel, that they would follow and, and do what God had called them to do. And they did this through a couple of ways. First, they did it through speaking the prophetic words that God gave them. And how that worked was that God would speak to the prophet, and the prophet would share it with the people of Israel, that they might be, uh, learn the ways that they should walk with God and be obedient to the calling God had given to them. So they would speak the prophetic words. But there's another thing that would happen in some prophets, especially you'll see uh, with Elijah and Elisha, some of the prophets worked miracles and were anointed to, to speak to the leaders of the nation. And sometimes they anointed the leaders to leadership, and sometimes they denounced them on behalf of God and God's plan. Well, specifically, when we think of Elijah... Elijah was the prophet of God during a very difficult time in Israel's history. There was a spiritual apostasy is the word we could use. And apostasy simply means that the nation of Israel had abandoned their faith in God and now were going and doing their own thing. And Elijah's job was to try to get them back on track through his words and through what God would have him do. They were going through a time in which each king, it seemed to say, after they were introduced, it would say, and they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, rather than they honored God and they followed Him. During this time, there was a succession of seven wicked kings who reigned over Israel. And in that time, they would then allow for idol worship and superstition and evil practices to take place in the nation. And the prophet's job was to correct these things on behalf of God. So that's what Elijah would do, and Elisha ultimately would be doing later. Well, our story takes place in Israel during the reign of Ahab. It was about 900 years before Christ, and in the midst of this, God had called Elijah to perform numerous miracles on his behalf, and he was to pronounce judgment on the wicked kings, and he did this faithfully, and he did this unto the Lord, and now he was about to be taken away and taken to heaven. I find it interesting, as I said earlier, that the, the chapter starts with this phrase that just seems so casual to me. It says, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. It just almost sounds like it's so commonplace that this was going to take place. But that's 
the foundation of where we're at when we look at this, this uh, road trip together. The second foundational thing that was happening is it was Elijah and Elijah were together on this road trip. And they were starting their road trip from a town called Gilgal, because it says Elijah and Elijah were on their way from Gilgal. And as we see on this road trip, Elijah was obedient. What we will see is that Elisha, in the midst of this, was called, empowered, and obedient to the Lord as he was preparing to do the work God called him to do. So let's break this down as we continue through, knowing that, it, that he was, Elijah was about to be taken away, and the two of them were going on a road trip together. So earlier, God directed Elijah to anoint Elijah to succeed him. So he went, and he obeyed what God had asked him to do. And it's in 1 Kings chapter 19. And if you want to turn there, maybe keep your spot in 2 Kings 2. It's only a couple of chapters back. In 1 Kings 19, we read of that encounter that Elijah had with Elijah when he went to anoint him, call him to his ministry. It's in 1 Kings 19, and it's in verse 19 we read, So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, and he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. And here it is, Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elijah then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. And it says in verse 21, then he, Elijah, set out to follow Elijah and become his servant, or other versions say his attendant. And here's what we know then about Elijah from that passage. First of all, he was a prosperous farmer, and he was a hard worker. He was out plowing the field. In fact, it tells us he had 12 uh, yoke of oxen, oxen, which means he had a fairly large farm. And as a profitable farmer and a prosperous farmer, he was busy doing the work that God had called him to do then. But the, suddenly Elijah shows up and says, God has called you to something else. There's also no indication that Elijah was even aware this was about to happen. So look how he responded. After a farewell to his family, he dropped everything, everything, and he followed Elijah. And when Elijah then, in that passage, it says he threw his cloak around him, this was Elijah anointing or declaring the calling of God on Elijah's life to be the next prophet for Israel. And as we will see, the cloak plays a significant role later in this story. Well, back to 2 Kings chapter 2, we see that Elijah went and he anointed Elisha. Elisha followed and became his attendant. Well, now it says that as they are on this trip where we know Elijah is about to be taken up into heaven and they're on their way from Gilgal, let's read on because verse 2 of 2 Kings chapter 2, back where we were, says that Elijah and Elisha, he, Elijah said to Elijah, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. It, it seems as we look at that passage that Elijah was testing Elisha to see if he was really committed to do what, what he was supposed to be doing. He was giving him a way out. But Elisha was determined, so off they went together. And when they arrived, it seems also that the word about what was about to happen to Elijah being taken up in, into, the, into the sky with the Lord had already been heard by the prophets because it tells us when they arrived at Bethel, verse 3, the company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha. They came out and listen what they asked. Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? And Elijah responded, yes, I know. So be quiet, he said. Now, this is a, a, an interesting part of the passage because we have this company of prophets. They arrive at Bethel, a company of prophets come, and they ask Elisha that question about, does he know what's about to happen? Uh, that term, the company of prophets, is something we probably don't hear a lot about. And what they were was a group of prophets of the Lord and they were usually associated more with a prominent prophet like Elijah. And somehow they knew what was about to take place. And so what we see is 
that Elisha, being asked that question by this group of prophets that, as I said, are probably prophets that were being trained by Elijah, he responds with, yes, I know. Another version says, of course I know. And he said, so please be quiet. Hmm. Seems to me like maybe Elisha at this point, on this road trip, knowing what is about to happen to Elijah, may be anxious or unsettled about what might be coming down the road for him. And so he seems to be a little bit rude with them and say, I know, please be quiet or be quiet. Well, three times this situation occurs with Elisha and Elijah. And I'm not going to read through it for, for us, but on the way to Bethel, we see that he says to him, stay here, I'm going to go to Bethel. And Elijah goes, no, I'm coming with you. Or Elisha says, I'm coming with you. And then after they're done that, Elijah again says, stay here for the Lord is sending me to Jericho. And again, Elijah, Elijah confirmed his commitment and says, no, I'm coming with you. Don't tell me to stay. And then a third time, this time they were going to go to the Jordan River. The road trip is taking different paths. And each time, Elijah says, you stay here. I'm going where God's called me. And Elijah says, no way. I'm coming with you. I'm committed to whatever the Lord has for me. And I want to go. Elisha, you see, and this is so important. Elisha understood that he was called. He remembers what happened with Elijah. And he wouldn't let anything keep him be, from being committed to the work that God had for him. He was going to go no matter what. Well, they're now at the Jordan River. This is the third location where we've gone through this same pattern. It's now the end of the road trip. And uh, as we see this, we begin to, to recognize that Elijah and Elijah's trip has come to an end or is about to come to an end. And this time we see verse 7, if you drop down to there, when they arrived, instead of the vision as you can picture it of when they arrived at Bethel or Jericho, that the whole the group of the prophets came out and asked Elisha the question. This time something different happens. The group doesn't ask the question. Look what verse 7 says, 50 men from the company of the prophets, another company of the prophets, went, but this time they stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elijah had stopped at the Jordan River. I want us to pause again for a second. I want you to see this in your, in your mind. They have arrived. The prophets have lined up. But this time, instead of coming and inquiring, they've stood at a distance. They're right by the Jordan River. Elijah and Elijah have walked up to the river, and they're standing back watching. And when they had reached that destination, listen to what happens. It says in verse 8, Elijah took his coat. He rolled it up and he struck the water with it. And the water divided to the right and to the left. And the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Wow. Incredible moment. Shades of the parting of the Red Sea with Moses and the children of Israel as they left Egypt. And as they did this, they did it in front of this group of prophets who saw all of this take place. And once they had reached the other side, as we follow along, Elijah now asks Elisha a very important question. The testing seems to be over. Elisha seems to have passed the test, but now it gets down to critical time. For he says in verse 9, tell me, what can I do for you before I go? I love this moment. Because Elijah, knowing what's about to take place, knowing that Elisha is about to take on this new, new role and this new mantle of, of being prophet, he stops and he says, what can I do for you? Elisha then asks Elijah what he knows he's going to need more than anything else. The senior prophet asks the junior who's about to become in charge, what can I do for you? And I love Elisha's response as well because Elisha begins to realize what he really needs. He knows he's called, but now he says, here's what I need. He knows he can't do it on his own and in his own power. So he says, we read on, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Elijah responded, I need a double portion of your Holy Spirit in order for me to do what God's called me to do. I don't want to try to do this on my own. I know the call. I saw the call. But now 
I need God to use me. Well, that's an interesting thing for him to ask for. It's something, again, that's a little different than what we would normally talk about. What is he ask, a, actually asking for at this moment? Does he want twice the power that Elijah had? Is he saying, give me a double portion of the Holy Spirit more than you had? Two helpings of, of, of your empowerment. Well, he wasn't asking to be better than Elijah. What he was asking for when he said a double portion was the language of that day, which was actually saying, I want to have the, uh, and be an heir of what you have had. I want to receive an inheritance in the Spirit from you that I can do what God's called me to do. And this inheritance wasn't about money. This inheritance wasn't about things. This inheritance was about having the empowerment of God in his life to do what he knew the call of God was going to be. He was saying, listen, Elijah, I have seen your ministry. I've walked with you for many years. I have seen your life, and I, I know that you're real and you're legitimate, and I know how you love God, and I know how you want to serve God, and I see how the Lord uses you as a prophet. And as God's prophet, I know I can't do this on my own. I need, I not only want, but I need the empowerment of God's Spirit in my life too. Elisha was asking for the right thing. He knew that he needed that in his life and I love Elijah's response because he begins to put it into perspective. He says, you've made this a difficult thing. A difficult thing. How is this a difficult thing? Well, what Elijah realizes with this request, which was the right request, Elijah realizes that this isn't his call on whether Elisha will receive that spiritual, spiritual heritage or not. That is up to God. And that is, if it's God's plan, then it will take place. And so he says, this is a hard thing because I can't do that for you unless it's God's will. But then he throws in this beautiful word, if, but if. For he says right then, yet, if you see me taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. He was basically saying, look, in other words, if God is going to give this to you, then God is going to give it to you. And if you see me taken up into heaven, as we know it's about to take place, then that will be the confirmation that God will do that for you. And then, after that took place, a remarkable finish to the road trip takes place. Look at verse 11. For it says, as they were walking along and talking together. Again, let's just pause there for a second because what has happened? We have had this incredible moment of interaction and, and, and a wonderful question that Elijah, Elijah asked Elijah, and then suddenly they're just walking along together. Maybe they're waiting to see what God will do, and then it all comes together. It says, as they were walking along, talking together, suddenly. Now, I want you again to put yourself in this place and to see what's happening. I want, as I read this, for you to just begin to picture what was happening in front of those 50 prophets lined up as they had crossed the river, and now they were walking along together and to see God's power come and do what they have been talking about this whole chapter. For it says, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared, and it separated the two of them. So the two of those them were separated, Elijah here and Elijah there. And then Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this. Young Elisha saw this. And he cried out, My father, my father, and the chariots and horsemen of, the Israel, of, of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Can you see that? What a powerful moment again to end the life of, of God's prophet and take him to heaven. Suddenly, they were separated, it says, and they, then as chariots of fire and horses of fire suddenly appeared, the miraculous occurred, and Elijah was taken up into heaven in a whirlwind. And all Elijah could do was cry out, my father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. He was in awe of what he saw. He was in awe of the power of God being manifested at that moment. And then he saw him no more. And here's how he responded. With all this taking place, suddenly it says that he took 
hold of his own garment. Elisha takes hold of his own garment and in an act of commitment tears it in two. In other words, he's saying, my old life, I'm tearing it and I'm throwing it away. And then he picked up Elijah's coat. The one that had fallen from him, the Scriptures say. This is the same coat that, that uh, we, we see the imagery of when he was anointed way back when he was on his farm. And now, the coat that Elijah used to, to roll up and part the waters of the Jordan, he sees his coat. He picks it up because it had fallen from him. And verse 13 says, he went back and he stood by the banks of the Jordan. And he took the coat that had fallen from Elijah and he struck the water with it. So he, Elijah had struck the water on this side, and they walked across on dry land before he was taken. Now Elijah, Elisha's taking that same coat, and he touches the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he said. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, just like it had happened before. And he crossed over. Today we have seen that seasoned prophet Elijah who went up now in a chariot and, and, and fire with, with the angels of God in, in their midst. And now we see Elisha taking that coat, having that empowerment with him as well. And he parted the waters and on he went. You know, as, as we have walked through this powerful and unique road trip, we learned a lot about Elisha. And I think it's important that we look inward as we think about all that happened to him. For the first thing we've seen through this is, well, Elijah knew the call of God on his life. He'd experienced that. And sometimes I think as followers of Christ, we forget that God has a call on our lives. Some of us forget the fact that God has gifted us and wants to use us. And you know, in these days with this pandemic where we've had to be so isolated, if we're not careful, we can forget. We can forget that God not only has, has given us new life through Christ, but in doing so, He's put a call on our lives. Elijah knew that. He knew the call. And my hope is that we would stop right now and just say, Lord, what call? What purpose do you have for my life as I follow you? The second thing I see of Elisha is he surrendered wholeheartedly to the work of the Lord. Left the farm that, that he needed to leave. Followed Elijah for all those years. And even at the end when he was being tested, was committed wholeheartedly. And he surrendered his heart to God, said, Lord, whatever it is you want me to do, I'm following through and I want you to do that. He knew the call. He surrendered wholeheartedly to the work God had for him. And he knew he couldn't do it on, on his own. The third thing is so important that he desired the empowerment of the Holy Spirit because he, he basically was saying, I can't be the prophet of God in my own strength. The Lord confirmed that again when he used that coat to touch the water. And I, I want us to notice as well at that moment as he now desired and received God's, God's Holy Spirit's empowerment to do the work that he had been called to do. Notice how the company of prophets in the next verse were still standing there and they had seen it. For verse 15 tells us the company of the prophets from Jericho who were still watching said, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. He was obedient. He, he surrendered himself. He desired the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and he received that. And it was confirmed by the fact that these prophets saw it, and he experienced it and walked across the Jordan. He was also obedient to do the work of the Lord that God called him to do. See, from there, we don't see this in this passage, Elisha went off and fulfilled the call of God in his life. You can, on your own, go and, and read through the passages of Scripture that follow and see how many times God used Elisha to be that prophet, to speak on God's behalf to a nation that was, again, in apostasy and was in rebellion against God. And his ministry was filled with prophetic words for the nation, the miraculous, and God used him greatly. 
What a great example for us as followers of Christ. And you see, none of us are called to be an Elijah or an Elisha. We're called to be who God made us to be. And we are called. And we are called to offer ourselves, just as we saw with Elisha, offer to call, offer ourselves up to God and whatever the calling is that he would have on our lives. And just as Elisha was called and empowered and was obedient, so we as followers of Christ are asked to recognize as, as his children, the ones he loves, that he desires to use us as well. I love the passage that we close with today in which as followers of Christ, we've, been, we've looked at it and it's been called the great commission for us the great commandment of what He wants us to do. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus draws His disciples, tells Him to go to a certain place in Galilee, to a mountain there. In verse 18, it tells us, and when Jesus came to them, He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Therefore, go Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It's a different season, isn't it, for us these days? And I know in the days to come, not far from now, there's going to be some changes and, and there's going to be work done to eventually begin to open up our building and an opportunity to meet together again. And this is the perfect time for us to pause and to ask the Lord, God, I know you are real and that you're working in my life. I know that you have called me. I know that you will empower me if I would look to you. And I desire that you would use me in the days to come. Whatever that is, we don't even know how that's going to look yet. But we do know this, Jesus in sending out his disciples, in Matthew 28, made this comment at the end. And sometimes we highlight all the other things, and they're so important. But he ends up by saying, surely I am with you always. Isn't that wonderful to know? God is with us. He's with us during this pandemic. And he will be with us as we move out of it and, and begin to do the things now that are going to be so different and so unique but He desires us to be His feet, His hands, and to touch those that need to hear the good news of Jesus and to be involved in what He is doing. And just as Elijah was called, he was empowered, and he was obedient, my prayer is that each one of us would recognize His call, that He wants to use us and empower us, and He wants us to obey Him. May the Lord help us and encourage us in the days ahead, I pray. And may, even as we've walked through and seen this road trip at the end, may we recognize that God wants to work in us. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for this road trip where we saw some remarkable things take place with Elijah and Elisha. But Lord, most importantly, we saw you in the middle of this entire story. You were there. You were calling, empowering, and sending. And I pray, God, for each one today that may we just have such a wonderful sense of your love, your presence, the working of your Holy Spirit in our lives, especially during this time that so much has been paused. I pray that you would just fill us anew today with the understanding of your great love, the call you've put on our lives, and your faithfulness, God, to do a great work in us. Help us, Lord, to be obedient, I pray, and to follow you with all our hearts. And it's in Jesus' name I ask. Amen. my heart to 
break me apart I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life and all I what you say that you're good your love is great I'm broken inside I'll give you my life I may be weak your spirit is strong in me may fail my God you never will I may be weak your spirit is strong in me my flesh may fail my God you never will I may be weak your spirit is strong in me my flesh may fail my God you never Thanks, Bill, for your amazing teaching. We hope that you found the message helpful and encouraging in your walk with Christ and that you'll be reminded of these truths throughout your week. We also want to remind you that you can stay connected to Compass by visiting the website and following us on social media. You'll especially want to stay tuned this in the coming weeks to hear more about our in-person service relaunch plans beginning this fall. Yep, you heard it guys, she said it, fall is coming. And like many of you, we're thinking towards fall startup at Compass as well. And we'd love for you to join us in prayer as we anticipate and navigate this new season, remembering that God always goes ahead of us as individuals, as families, and as a church. Well, that's just about it for us. We hope you'll join us again next week as we uncover the amazing story of Naaman's miraculous healing. That's right. You won't want to miss it, guys. We hope to see you again next week right here online. Have a great week. Bye.